My name is Michael Drykorn. I live on Pine Island uh, in the small enclave of uh, Boquilla. That's uh, one of the barrier islands uh, that are sandwiched between Cape Coral and Sanibel. Uh, I've lived in Lee County for uh, going on 11 years. I'm a former military man, a, a retired business executive, and I have been running a small business for the last 13 years, 11 of which have been in Lee County. Uh, primary background is aviation, space, and defense, really very highly regulated industry. Uh, I've got an immense experience with regards to uh, uh, the legislative processes, with regulatory compliance, regulatory development, international trade treaties, uh, manufacturing systems, um, and making businesses work. Um, I am running for the state senate uh, as a, a conservative Republican, and uh, I aim to bring uh, accountability and, and honesty back to the position of state senate. Do you feel that accountability and honesty have been lacking? I do. Tell us about that. Well, I believe, um, you know, in particular, um, when we talk about what's important to Florida and we look at what happened this last session, uh, people aren't um, uh, holding themselves accountable for some of the things that are less than fortunate. We hear everybody talking about how they're uh, not for Common Core, but the reality is is that Common Core didn't even get a hearing this last session. Um, it, it deserved it. Um, they had plenty of uh, public outlaw for it uh, to... to, to, to uh, to, to remove it from Florida, but the, the reality is, is the, the person that's incumbent in the position I'm running for introduced it to Florida in 2013. So it's a question of, of honesty with regards to where they stand on these issues. We also had infringement on small business. You know, a beer bill was passed that in, infringed on what they refer to as growlers. It, so it, it, it tied the hands of small businesses on, on their creativity and how they can provide a market niche to our, um, to our consumers. Southwest Florida does not have big business. It's all small business. And for any legislator who claims to represent Southwest Florida, not to support small business, they're not being honest to their constituents. And then finally, you know, there's the, we had the in-state tuition for illegal aliens. That is not without an expense. You know, there's the, the, the delta between what uh, a full-time student should be paying and in-state tuition is quite significant. It's going to be at the burden of taxpayers. But more importantly, it is like putting a sugar pot on the coffee table. It is an incentive for ants. If you put the sugar pot there, ants will show up. If you put in-state tuition for illegal aliens, we're going to have more illegal aliens. It, the more incentives that we provide, those that are not citizens, the more we're going to have non-citizens coming. So our, 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 our representatives are not honest about what they're doing. And if we look at our immigration, what's going on on the border right now, Florida has taken over $75 million in the first three quarters of this year for refugee support. And it's a program that is, it's federally funded, but the governors have to request the money at the beginning of each federal fiscal year. So when we say they don't, when, when, when they say, the incumbents say they are not for bringing all these kids here. The reality is they've already asked for the money. Couldn't that money, though, go to other forms of immigration support for folks that are here before the, before the recent influx and to try to offset the cost of what the federal government should have been doing? I mean, isn't that the state saying, federal government, you've fallen down on the job, give us some money to help uh, atone for that or to deal with that? Well, it, it's, it's discretionary upon each state. Each governor gets to decide the level of their participation. And, and, and if you look at the distribution of the, over the 50 states and its territories, it varies from state to state. For example, a border state like Arizona received $4 million this entire year. Why? Because the governor didn't want to support the refugee system within their state. Whereas California had $147 million so far in the first three quarters. Florida is in the $70 million. It's going to be $98 million by the end of the year. Um, the, the reality is, is that you know, the federal government does not have the authority to dictate where refugees go unless the state allows them. And it's, and it's not because it's a constitutional authority for the federal government. It becomes a contractual. So if we take their money, we are contractually obligated to deploy whatever federal program they want to have deployed. And the reality is it's never enough money because the taxpayers will be making up the difference. You know, it's roughly about $1,800 a head this year 
on, on calculations with the federal government funding, we make up the difference through our, our, our DCF and, and other activities. So if the state is making up that difference already and, and Florida were to turn down that $75 million, who picks up that cost then? The refugees don't come here. But some of them are already here. I mean, some children were brought over very young and they're here. We're talking about new. So this well, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't impact existing. So uh, last year in Lee County, we had 574 uh, um, uh, refugees. So, but let's put it in the context for the state. Last year, it was 53,000. In the last uh, seven years, it's over 220,000 refugees. That's almost twice the size of Cape Coral in just seven years. That's, that's significant. So we're, nobody's talking about this stuff. Those and, are individuals that the federal government has relocated here or moved here or given permission to move here, sp specifically with their authority, as opposed to illegal immigrants perhaps who come and go and move about in the shadows as they speak, who maybe nobody really knows where right. they are. This is, ex this is explicitly those that are covered under CFR 400, which is a refugee mandate by the federal government, and that the funding is provided under, under those conditions. And the governors of each state have to, to appoint a state coordinator who in our case is, is part of the DCF, um, to, to actually manage this. So we know, as a matter of fact, for, for the next fiscal year, the governor has to um, put their budget into the feds within 30 days from now. We don't know what's in that budget with regards to what's going on. And that's the kind of transparency we need, and that's the kind of dialogue we need to have with citizens. You know, I, I ran on, on, uh, on a platform that's called the C4, so that all my decisions are going to be constitutionally valid. I'm going to get on the right committees to make sure that I can, I can influence the things that are important. I'm going to develop coalitions uh, within, those, uh, within the elected body to make sure that I can, I, I'm, I'm more successful. But the fourth C is the most important, and that's the constituency outreach. That's making sure that the people that have uh, employed me as their representative know what's going on because it's too, so complex. How did I find out about all this? It's not like I'm sitting there looking for conspiracy theories. I happen to be on the Florida approved supplier list for services. You know, my company, I have a day job, but my services happen to be management, consulting, and engineering. I just happen to have gotten the RFQ to bring a whole bunch of refugees to Lee County. So, and I started reading into it, and I go, oh my God, wh why isn't anybody else talking about this, especially county commissioners? How many refugees were involved in that RFQ? Uh, the undetermined. Um, it, it's, a, it's a general funding of about $2 million. Uh, the incumbent contract holder will probably get it, which is the uh, Catholic Charities. Okay. You mentioned as part of your uh, business experience, uh, experience with the legislative process. Can you tell us how that ties into business? That's something most people probably don't connect to a business dealing with the legislative process. Sure. sure. So you got to follow the money. Um, and, and the money, in, in our case, in government, uh, flows in all directions, whether it comes from the federal government or if it comes from our revenue in, in income taxes, which we don't have in, in Florida, or if it comes from business taxes, which we do have in Florida. You have to understand where the sources of revenue are and what kind of impediment those, that resource or that, 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 the, the, the funding uh, provides on other aspects of your business model. For instance, the higher our tax structure on business, the, the, the lower the probability that businesses are going to come here. So the, the, the more tax-friendly we have as an environment here in Florida, we're going to have more business, which means more jobs, which means more revenue. You know, if we can get people in Immokalee and Lehigh Acres good-paying jobs, a lot of our social issues will be resolved. So with regards to understanding and uh, the, the applying a business savvy, you need to understand how to work the numbers. In combining that with legislative experience, you have to understand how the government system works for funding. And, and I've been doing that for 34 years. Um, and I, I used to work for the Federal Aviation Administration. I was the number two guy in the FAA for all production and airworthiness. I negotiated international treaties, national policies, promulgated lots of rulemaking, managed the, the oversight uh, organization for all of the manufacturing worldwide for the FAA. Um, we're talking big budgets. After that, I was a vice president of quality for Pratt & Whitney. You know, it's a $36 billion uh, part of a corporation, United Technologies. Um, the 24-7 job, facilities all over the world, highly regulated industry. 
You're influencing the, the, the rulemaking not only in this country, but rulemaking around the world. Uh, because we have facilities in Singapore, in Europe, in, in China. So you, you have to be abreast on that. And you have to understand what your risks are and where your opportunities are. And you, how can you best influence it for the shareholder? As a, as a representative, my shareholder is the voter, the citizen. Where is your business connection on the state level? My business connect. I have very little business connections in Florida. Uh, with regards to... Um, actually conducting business here in Florida, um, most of my business is over in the Melbourne, uh, Cape Canaveral area, Tampa. Uh, so it's where the, the major uh, aerospace and, yeah, and defense contractors are. And government, uh, NASA. As far as understanding the legislative process and how it reflects, uh, interacts with business on the state level, where do you get that uh, knowledge from? Well, it, it's, again, it's not rocket science. Um, it, it, it's all provided in, in, in written policy and procedures. Uh, the problem is, is that um, most uh, elected officials don't follow those uh, policies and procedures. We have a thing called the, the Sunshine Act here in Florida, right? It means that certain things can only be discussed in public forums. That is violated every day in Tallahassee. And those that say that they get things done behind the scenes are admitting to violating the Sunshine Act. So the, the reality is, is that I'm a quick read on, on, on almost any topic. Uh, with regards to working um, uh, within a, a unique legislative process, Florida's not that unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a state process. And, and I, I can apply my federal experience very quickly into Tallahassee. You had bypassed running for a county office. You decided to run for a federal office. Why now are you running for a state office? Yeah, well, it's 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 a state of emergency. Um, I felt that in the congressional race, uh, we needed to have strong leadership uh, for state representation in Washington D.C. I, I'm very a, a very strong supporter of the Tenth Amendment. And for those that are not familiar with the Tenth Amendment, it's the division of powers between the federal government and the state uh, and the states. The, the reality is that the federal government has, it continuously oversteps its, its authority as provided in Section 1, uh, uh, sorry, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And, and so the next logical step for me, if I'm not going to be able to represent in Congress at this time, is at, is at a state level because we have to push back. And, and the reality is, is how do you push back at the state level? Well, it's stop accepting the federal money. You know, we talk about immigration. There will be no place for the federal government to put unwanted immigrants if the states don't take them. The federal government doesn't own the land. The federal government doesn't have the sovereignty within the state to place them there. We need to stop that. When it comes to health insurance, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court has, has ruled that insurance is a state responsibility. And, and it recently supported that again and, and, and just two weeks ago. So at the state level, we can redefine what we're going to do with the ACA, if we so choose to. With regards to water, the Army Corps of Engineers continuously opens the valve without any coordination with the state. And, and, and that's just flat wrong, because all the damage is, is occurring to the people of the state, not the federal government. We need to take the control of the valve back. So what we need to be able to do is influence that contractual relationship between Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. And that's where the business experience comes in again, because it, it's not a regulatory requirement. It's a contractual obligation. Are you being, have you received financial support from any organizations? No. So? It's purely citizens. What specifically do you feel your uh, opponent has fallen down on in Tallahassee? Number one, Common Core. Number two, preservation of our Second Amendment rights. Three, being honest to the, 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 the citizens. Can you elaborate on the uh, Second Amendment where she's fallen down in terms of the Second Amendment? All right. So Dane Eagle pr uh, presented a uh, Second Amendment preservation bill earlier this last session, and uh, he uh, very quickly we uh, took it back, and he, it took, he took it back at the encouragement of leadership. The Senate Majority Leader is leadership. 
there was a campaign going on, a congressional campaign, that would have provided some embarrassment for her if she was directly involved in the Second Amendment Preservation Act um, or asking for it to, to go back. The NRA was opposed to the Second Amendment Re Preservation Act. It sounds a little weird, doesn't it? The reality is it, it wasn't a document developed by the NRA. So it wasn't created by them. They weren't going to support it. The reality is it was created by the Southwest Florida Citizens Alliance and local citizens. The people of Florida wanted it. Yet the, pe the legislators that were representing the people were not courageous enough to, to but move it forward, at least to a hearing. If the people want something, you owe it to them to drive it forward and at least get a hearing on it. What was, what was so controversial about it, or what, do you recall what aspect of it was that the NRA didn't like or that the, the Citizens Coalition did like? No, well, the, the almost identical language has already been approved in about 17 other states. It, it, it's not a controversial act. I mean, it essentially says if there's ever an executive order, and heaven forbid that we ever have a president that doesn't respect the Constitution, but if there's ever an executive order that says uh, do X, Y, Z that may infringe on the Second Amendment, what it says is that no state employee shall ever enforce that, that illegal executive order. And, and so there's nothing controversial in, in that. And this is it's about as simple as it is. Um, I promise that, that will be my second act of duty as, as the state senator to reintroduce that. The first will be to repeal Common Core. How do you go about doing that? I mean, it's, it's federal, it's, it's a federal initiative. How does, what does the state do? Common Core or the Second Amendment Preservation? Common Core. Common Core is not a federal. Common Core is, is attached to those dollars, again, mm -hmm. from the Department of Education, which is, again, if we get back to the Constitution, the Department of Education is not one of the Article I, Section 8 provisions of the, of the federal government. It was created by Jimmy Carter, right? So it's, it's relatively a recent phenomenon in American history. Um, that is, is a, a federal cookie that we accept, which is not nutritious, but we now become obligated to enforce whatever is, is in that contract. We need to expel the contract. And, and people say, well, there's funding associated. Not that much. Nothing that we can't do internally ourselves in, in, in Florida. We just had a $3 billion spend down on our, on our, on our debt. We just gave a half, a mil, or half a billion dollars back to taxpayers through the tag tax. And we just um, reduced taxes by $350 million. We can do these things if it's important enough for us to do. But the question is, is it what we want to do as a citizen base in Florida? I think it is. What do you replace it with? Is, is there some sort of testing or school accountability that should be in place, standards uh, for schools that should be in place, and can you describe them? We've always had them. I mean, we have SATs, ACTs, that's a national standard. We had FCATs, which is a Florida standard. Um, we don't need any authority, even in Tallahassee, to tell us what the content of our education is. You go to Tallahassee, the biggest building in Tallahassee, Department of Education. Why? Collier County has almost a billion dollar budget for education. Lee County has $1.3 billion of, of, of funding for, for education. I think we need to decentralize the span and control of education in Florida. Maintain Florida type standards, and I'm not saying Florida standards because that's what, that's what they're calling Common Core right now. What we need is indigenously developed standards that make Florida the highest um, achieving educational system in the country. I, I grew up in one of those. I grew up in Southern California when, when Governor Reagan was, was the governor. We had the highest academic achievement in the entire country at that time. It went out of control after he, after he left. It's, it's not the federal government that ensures the kids are educated. It's our local parents. It's our local school board, it's our local churches, our local civic groups. It's, it's we that do it. So if we aren't doing our job, we need to get all of the speed bumps out of our way so that we can do it, and we need to hold ourselves accountable for it. And that's why we elect school boards. When you say get the speed bumps out of the way, are you advocating uh, disbanding the State Department of Education? Not completely. Um, I mean, there's still a purpose for it, right? We still need uh, state standards. We still need to ensure that, that communities that can't afford education because they don't have the tax base still have the ability. That's what makes us great as a state. You know, there's some interior communities and interior counties to Florida that, that need love.
right? So we, we, need, we, we need to make sure that that happens. Um, but with regards to uh, telling a, a, a county how they're going to manage their transportation system of their bus schedules, and that's what Tallahassee does, and that's a big part of our budgets in both of our counties, um, that's, that's redundant. It's ridiculous. We know best how to manage transportation in Lee County and in Collier County and in Charlotte County, uh, where this, this district actually represents. Um, I don't believe that they should tell us what the books are. You know, I think that the parents and the teachers and, and the administrators have, can do a really good job of telling us what books we're going to read. You know, and, and, it, and it goes on both ends of the spectrum, right? Whether it's a, a liberalist book or a radical right-wing book, you know, it shouldn't be dictated by the government. It should be told by the parents of what we think is important. Because the parents and the community respect, they reflect the values of that area. And not all areas have the same values. Where else would you see cutting back the state bureaucracy? You mentioned transportation, education, where else? Permitting. Permitting is huge in the state. It, it takes, um, if, if I was going to open a convenience store somewhere in the southeast part of the United States, and I, w I was looking at Georgia and Florida. Georgia, I can go in there and I can get myself a 7-Eleven, get all my permitting done and be done. Done with it all within 90 days. Florida, 15 months. So if I've got my dollars to spend, I, and my dollars are not working for me because I'm waiting for the permitting process, I'm going to Georgia. What we need to do is streamline our permitting process, take, take the federal government out of a lot of it, because they don't, the Army Corps of Engineers are almost on every permit with, with, around here because it's water. They don't need to be on it. These are our sovereign waters. We can figure it out. DEP is almost on every uh, permit. And why are we sending things to Tallahassee for a lot of approvals? We need to take the DEP and decentralize it so that we have local discretion and integration at the county level. Uh, and, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of these issues like you guys recently had down here in Collier County with fracking, right? So where the, the, the DEP in Tallahassee approved a, uh, a, a, a drilling permit and there was a violation found by the DEP at a state agency your county commissioners didn't know about it for six months. That's a sin. That is just absolutely ridiculous. So I would force greater integration of, of, of statewide requirements or resources like DEP into the county level to streamline the business processes so that businesses can get on with business and, and that we reduce the amount of bureaucracy on, uh, on the whole system. And I, there's another 20 examples. We're going to run out of time. Uh, issue that seems to get, keep getting put off till the next session, put off till the next session, uh, casino gambling in the state. What are your views on that? So I signed a pledge for no, no further casinos. Um, now, I, I also recognize that we have card playing at Greyhound Parks, and, and the card playing is linked to the dogs running. I've also signed a pledge to de-link those two because what we're doing is we're putting dogs at risk just for the benefit of playing cards. So we can we could simply grandfather those in for with no expansion to the existing to allow them to do both but maintain a healthy population of the dogs. Don't put them at risk. The uh, the Indian casinos would stay. The Indian I casinos are grandfathered. I mean, this is that's more of a federal issue that the state gets to vote on. Um, so there's there's no harm no foul there. What about all of the uh, uh Gaming centers and arcades that were opened up that the legislature cracked down on. Where you? Yeah, I, I don't support the the strip mall casinos. I mean, the, I, I, you know, gambling is an addictive behavior. Um, it is probably more addictive than heroin in some regards. Uh, I've seen family members suffer from that, um, and I got to tell you, I, I, I don't think we need to make it easier for people to have access to something that is not necessarily a value added process to our society. Um, there are other options, right? And so go to the, the dog track or go to the Indian facility. Uh, Charlotte's Web that was approved by the legislature. We've got the uh, amendment coming up on uh, legalizing medical marijuana. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, Charlotte's Web is, is obviously was appropriately approved, needs to be there. Um, I, I, I would say what we are doing in Florida is the objective is to make cannabis based medicines available to those who genuinely need them, right? But we're going about it the wrong way. The reality is, is the, the Drug Enforcement Agency manages this thing called Schedule 1. 
and they have cannabis on Schedule 1. In order to be on Schedule 1, it, it has to have no medicinal use. Well, come on. 20 years ago, they approved Marinol. Marinol is a cannabis-based substance that treats seizures and, and other behaviors. Charlotte's Web is another example. Outside of the United States, cannabis is widely used for various therapeutic uses. Amendment 2 is, gonna, is, a, is a Pandora's box. Um, the people are going to vote on it, so it doesn't matter what I think about Amendment 2, but it's a Pandora's box that's going to, it's a slippery slope that can lead to abuses of aligning cannabis to unapproved therapy and undocumented illnesses. So what I believe we need to do is get it off, and, and this is the way you do it. The governor needs to have the courage to tell our attorney general, Bondi, to file a suit against Eric Holder and the executive branch who manages the DEA to a properly put cannabis off of Schedule 1 onto Schedule 2, allowed into the pharmaceutical testing and allocation to therapy, because there's about 30,000 different strands of cannabis. Which one works for which illness? Well, that's where the pharmaceutical and science community get involved. Get it in and, and prescribe it like any other substance. It comes in a little orange bottle with your name on it. You have a prescription, and it's issued through a pharmacy by a doctor, not a dispensary by a quack. So you've talked about a, a, a long-term solution to affordable flood insurance. I'm all, I'm, we're all ready for that. What would you recommend? Yeah, I, I live on the water. I, uh, you know, we we just recently kicked the can down in, in Congress uh, about seven to ten years, depending on how you look at it, with regards to this massive inflation and flood insurance. Um, I'll go back to what the the, the Supreme Court and uh, and what they they've ruled in, in it actually was passed in 1947 by the McCarran Act. Insurance is a state issue, right? And so when when flood insurance was created as a result of the free market not wanting to do it anymore, because it used to be part of our homeowner's insurance up until the 50s. In the mid-60s, um, you know, from, so the, the mid-50s, there was no more flood insurance. Catastrophe after catastrophe, run on, 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 on uh, our tax dollars to, to come up with disaster aid. Um, Congress came up with this national flood insurance policy. Well, the reality is it violated the McCarran Act, and from my perspective, because it, it allowed communities to opt in, which when it says a community opts in, building standards, elevation standards, et cetera, et cetera. But those communities went from state to state to state to state. And, 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 and so what we need to do is have a Florida solution to this, like, like we do citizens. Okay, citizens is supposed to be an insurer of last resort. We, we need to, to encourage the free market to get back into flood insurance and establish rates that are affordable and have citizens as an insurer of last resort for those pay, those those instances that where it's just not going to be picked up by the free market. But I think it needs to be a Floridian solution because our flood issues get rated nationally. We don't have the propensity for flooding that Louisiana and Texas have. So I think we'll find it's a win-win for Florida. How would you encourage the free market to get back into flood insurance? Incentives or how? Well, you, 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 as a business person, you reach out to them and you have conversations. All right. So you, you, we have, we have, uh, we don't have an insurance commissioner in Florida, right? But we have um, uh, other uh, secretaries or appointed uh, folks that are, that, are, uh, that are responsible for insurance. That needs to be their charter given by the governor and supported by the Senate and the House of Representatives, the representatives. We need to understand, we need to first decide that's what we want. And I believe it is, because that's our long-term sustainable plan. Every time we, 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 we depend on the federal government for our salvation in Florida, we become dependent and we no longer uh, become sovereign. And, and, and I think if we want, I mean, we did really well back um, uh, 11 years ago, actually it's going to be 10 years ago, uh, August 13th, you know, when we had a strong National Guard here in Florida, we hadn't been sending them over to the sandboxes often, you know, and those hurricanes hit. My house was destroyed after Hurricane Charlie, right? So we, we responded 
enforce. We, we, we did it the Floridian style. There was no representatives of the feds where I lived. Um, I lived out on Pine Island. We had, we had sheriffs and police officers from Halea, the other side of the state coming over. It was Floridians helping Floridians. And I think we know how to do this better than the feds. Michael, that's uh, about out of time. Is there anything we haven't talked about that uh, you wanted to mention? Make sure to get in there. Well, you know, I'm not a career politician. I have no expectations or ambitions to become a career politician. Whether I make a second term or not, that's for the people to decide. I will not be influenced by the establishment. I will not uh, side with, with one party or the, another, or the other if it's wrong and is not consistent with the Constitution and not consistent with my constituents. I don't represent anybody but the people. In order for me to run right now, I am, I am standing up as, a, as an individual that is just a very upset person from Pine Island that says we can do this together. And that's why I'm running. Okay.